When Mark Hayaton was 69, he was diagnosed with squamous cell thymic carcinoma, a deadly cancer that affects the lymphatic and endocrine systems. His doctor told him he likely had months to live. One of the most frightening things I've ever seen was sort of by accident when I saw on a medical consultant's laptop of the scan, metastases to lungs, liver, thoracic cavity, my right humerus, my left scapula. That was six years ago. He survived thanks to an experimental drug that rapidly shrank his tumors and eased his pain. What's particularly noteworthy about Mark Hayaton's surprising recovery was that the drug that saved his life hadn't been approved by the FDA. That would come six years later, at which point Hayaton probably would have been long dead. He was able to take it anyway thanks to Right to Try, a legal movement that led to the passage of laws in 41 states allowing doctors to prescribe terminal patients with experimental drugs that haven't passed muster with regulators. Some bills, they don't have a good name. Okay. They really don't. But this is such a great name. From the first day I heard it, it's so perfect. Right to Try. In May of 2019, President Trump signed Right to Try into federal law. It was championed by Vice President Mike Pence, who had signed a version of the legislation himself in 2015. Whatever happens next, I've had a great quality of life. We've continued to travel. We've been able to take our grandchildren on trips. Mark Hayaton's story underscores the deadly consequences of FDA overreach. The right to try laws, which were engineered by a small free market think tank in Arizona called the Goldwater Institute, are a shot across the bow at the FDA's core mission. It's a real culture change in Washington, D.C. It's one of the first times in recent history where Congress has told the FDA you're overstepping your boundaries. And I think that that's not the end of the story. This is just the beginning. Concern over the tragic effects of the new sedative thalidomide prompts President Kennedy at his press conference to call for stronger, better administered drug laws. Founded in 1906, the Food and Drug Administration didn't become a powerful force in American healthcare until the 1960s, when a sedative called thalidomide was marketed to pregnant women in Europe. It turned out that when their mothers took thalidomide, about 40% of babies died in utero or shortly after birth. Those that survive often had severe birth defects like shortened limbs and deformed organs. Americans mostly dodged the thalidomide tragedy thanks to FDA physician Francis Oldham Kelsey, who was concerned about its safety and kept it off the U.S. market. Her decision saved thousands of lives and earned her the Presidential Medal of Freedom. At the time, the FDA's mandate was to determine if a drug had dangerous side effects before approving it for use. After the thalidomide scandal, a new law gave the agency broad authority to determine if new drugs also did what they claimed, and to prevent Americans from trying them until its investigation was complete. It turned out there was an enormous cost to caution. Thalidomide's hidden victims were those denied access to life-saving medicines because of regulatory overreach. In the decade after the FDA expanded its scope, new drug approvals fell by about two-thirds. Today, the average cost to get a drug past the FDA to market has risen to $2.7 billion, and the number of new drugs approved per billion dollars spent has halved every nine years since 1960. And yet, there was little public outrage over the impact on medical innovation. Images of children deformed in utero by an untested drug spur public action, but the victims of a regulatory environment that limits access and curbs innovation go unnoticed. But libertarian reformers at the Goldwater Institute discovered one scenario that the public could rally around, cases in which terminally ill patients are denied the right to try experimental drugs. David Huntley, who suffered from ALS, a neurodegenerative disease that destroys all motor function, fought for access to a drug in clinical trials that could slow the progression of his disease. FDA impeded his access to GM604, a potentially life-altering treatment. Without any treatment, I will pass in three to nine months. How is keeping a potentially life-saving drug from me saving my life? The decision to use an investigational drug to fight a fatal disease should be between a patient and his or her doctor. 
Huntley died in July 2015 and never got access to GM604, which is in limbo after completing phase two clinical trials. In September 2016, ALS sufferers testified before Congress. Right now we have no hope. So it's either, you know, hope or no hope. And this bill, it doesn't do everything, but it moves us in the direction of having a little bit of hope. When chemotherapy failed to shrink Mark Hayaton's tumors, there were no FDA-approved treatment options left. But he was accepted into a clinical trial run by Dr. Ibrahim Delpassand, a nuclear oncologist testing an experimental drug called lutetium-177 dotate. It turned out to have very few side effects. Many of our patients, if you look at them, you can't even tell that they are undergoing cancer therapy. So typically they don't lose their hair, they don't get sick. My cough disappeared, the tumors started to shrink, and people literally thought I was cured. Nobody knew why it was working, but it was working. At the end of the final phase three clinical trial, the drug had eliminated tumors in a majority of patients. After the trial concluded, two and a half years went by before the FDA would approve the drug. In the meantime, Dr. Del Passand requested permission from the agency to continue administering it to participants like Hayatin, who were being kept alive by the treatment, and to new patients with endocrine cancer. Many cancer patients, they can't wait. Their disease in an advanced phase, and if we lose that momentum, if we do not give them the treatment on time, uh, essentially we lose that opportunity to control the disease. His request was denied. It was a very difficult time for me at that point because what can I tell these patients and their family members? Hayaton asked the FDA to reconsider. The FDA wrote a nice letter to me saying, well, thanks very much, but we can see that you didn't in fact have a complete response. And I said, well, maybe not, but I would have been dead before I was writing this letter without the response I did have, and only a few cancers have the possibility so far of complete responses. The odds are already so stacked against the patient, it doesn't help to have the FDA taking positions like this. The FDA should never be the decision maker. The FDA can require testing, the FDA can make sure that people have enough information so that they can make good decisions, but at the end of the day, it should be the patient and the doctor who are the ones that are making the decision. The Goldwater Institute presented the problems that Dr. Del Passan's patients were having to the Texas legislature, which quickly passed a right to try law. Hayatun got continued access to the treatment, as did 77 of Del Passan's other patients. And in the roughly two years between when the FDA told him to stop giving these treatments to patients to when the treatment was finally approved for market, he treated about 200 patients. Uh, and many of them were told they only had months to live, and many of them are still alive today. Though the FDA declined our interview requests, the agency has emphasized its own expanded access program called Compassionate Use, which allows some terminal patients to try experimental drugs. According to a 2017 Government Accountability Office report, the FDA approved 5,697 of 5,753 requests that came through the Compassionate Use program between 2012 and 2015. Critics argue that because of this program, right to try laws are superfluous. But before right to try, getting approval through compassionate use involved significant bureaucratic hurdles. According to the nonprofit Regulatory Affairs, right to try state laws pressured the FDA to streamline the application process. Del Passand used the FDA's expanded access program to provide some of his patients with the drug, but once the drug was on track for commercial approval, the FDA wouldn't let him enroll any new patients. It was only through Texas's right to try law that the rest of Del Passan's patients, including Hayaton, were able to continue to get their treatment. I wouldn't be sitting here talking to you now if compassionate use was all I had had. Right to Try allows pharmaceutical companies to sell experimental drugs at cost. And unlike compassionate use, protects them from liability and reporting requirements if a patient dies or suffers on account of a bad reaction. No pharmaceutical in their right mind would give me a drug compassionately. Because if I have an adverse event, which, you know, I'm an ALS patient, let's face it, I probably will. They have to report that to the FDA and it's going to jeopardize in their trial. Drug approvals have been derailed in the past by adverse effects occurring under compassionate use. A patient should be able to weigh 
the potential that the drug might not work or the drug might have very serious side effects against the potential that the drug could actually save their lives. Nobody can make that decision for a patient. That is up to the individual themselves, not a drug company, not a doctor, and certainly not the FDA. Critics also say Right to Try has only helped a small number of patients so far, although there are no official numbers to date. Sandifer says she expects that to change as drug manufacturers and doctors become more familiar with the law. Right to Try is a very small but a very important first step in the right direction. Ultimately, I would love to see a system that is more patient-centric. I would love to see a system that gives patients more options so that they don't have to be beholden to the FDA. And this is especially true of terminally ill patients because when people are fighting for their lives, they shouldn't have to fight the government as well. Sandifer says that Right to Try is just the beginning of the push for greater pharmaceutical freedom. Policy researcher Bartley Madden, for example, has floated a proposal already being implemented in Japan under which any patient could access experimental drugs that pass initial safety screenings without any FDA involvement at all. Their outcomes would be logged in publicly accessible databases, enabling a freer flow of information and possibly faster breakthroughs. Thanks to Right to Try, Mark Hayaton has lived for six years beyond his doctor's initial expectations. Time that he spent with his wife of 54 years, vacationing with his grandchildren, and caring for his elderly mother. But recently his cancer returned, and he's now searching for another miracle. I don't know how soon this journey will end, but I am really grateful for Right to Try.